Welcome back to the Bitcoin Layer. I'm Nick Batia, and today we have a very special guest for you, Caitlin Long. Caitlin is a longtime Bitcoin advocate and industry participant. Uh, she is someone that I have uh, grown to rely on for information from the Bitcoin financial infrastructure perspective. Caitlin, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Nick, it's great to see you. That's, uh, we're, we've been in a mutual fan club of each other's for a while. You, uh, you taught me a lot about plumbing in the fixed income market. We figured out that, that a lot of the things we were both thinking were true actually did come true and then started working together on all that. There aren't very many of us with the depth of plumbing expertise and who, who would call ourselves proud, proud plumbers, but you and I are both nerdy enough <laughs> to fit that category. Exactly. Well, our first conversation surrounded Treasury repo, and um, I think that <laughs> I honestly think that they will for a long time to come, Caitlin. So True. maybe we can talk about some of that stuff today. But uh, I wanted to lead with what you see going on with GBTC. Uh, it is right front and center right now. We had, of course, the FTX saga. I think that that is slowing down as we get a little bit further away from the arrest and um, some of the bankruptcy proceedings. GBTC is now center stage. So we have a situation which the vehicle reached a 50% discount to net asset value. It's come back a little bit over the last few days, maybe because there's this redeem GBTC campaign going on, maybe something else. Tell us what your opinion is on this whole situation, please. Well, I wrote a piece back in May, I believe, in Newsweek, laying out that when the beginning of these leveraged credit blowups in the Bitcoin and crypto space, um, when that started, it was, of course, the fault of the people involved who were leveraged speculators and in a lot of cases, outright frauds. But... There was another piece to the equation, which is that the GBTC leveraged arbitrage trade was a, was a bomb that went off in secondary markets, in trading markets for Bitcoin. And that was not a function of Bitcoin at all. And that's the most important piece that I would stress, that whatever happens with GBTC has nothing to do with Bitcoin itself, the protocol. It just keeps on trucking. It just keeps on adding new blocks every 10 minutes on average. The hash rate uh, recently hit an all-time high. It's come off a little bit now, and I expect it to come off a little bit. But the security of Bitcoin is essentially is near all-time highs. All those things are, are great, great fundamentals. So what's going on with GBTC? It just impacts the secondary trading market. Now, the secondary trading market is what a lot of people focus on. I know you and I don't really focus on it that much because the truth is that uh, there's so much more than, uh, than, than the trading market. I've said for a long time, the price of Bitcoin is, I think, one of the least is interesting aspects of it. But I know a lot of others w wouldn't agree with me. And so, um, so back to your question, <laughs> uh, the, what happened is the SEC approved one and only one way for broke for, for 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 people who have brokerage accounts in the United States to get to get exposure to Bitcoin. And they did that initially in 2013 and then reapproved it in 2015. And then they didn't approve the SEC didn't approve a second version of it until early 2021. And that the GBTC trust is a closed end fund. Now the at a high level what that means is that there's a finite number of shares. There are a lot of technicalities to the way the trust works, and I'm not a ETF and closed-end fund expert. There are people out there who do nothing but exactly this, in you know, dive into the weeds of the trust structures. But the gist is, closed-end funds generally trade at a discount to spot. They're meant to track the spot price, but because there are fees associated with the fund, they will generally trade at a discount to spot. Okay, so that's what everybody expects with closed end funds. Now, GBTC is an extreme exception to that because at one point it traded to a 175% premium to spot Bitcoin price. And it got as low, as you said, to a 50% discount more recently to the spot Bitcoin price. So it has failed to, to track the 
the spot price of Bitcoin. Why is that? It's a structural issue. And it gets back to the fact that with a closed end fund, when you have supply demand imbalances, you can't continually mint new units in order to meet the new demand coming in so that supply is met with demand. And same is true when you have redemptions. That's that's closer to how an ETF works, but that's not how a closed end fund works. And so the SEC has known for years, the, this whole securities industry has known for years that the, the closed end funds can trade at big premiums and big discounts. It's, it's ju- usually more of a discount than a premium. But um, obviously in the bull market for Bitcoin, with there being one and only one alternative and it being a fundamentally flawed structure with a closed end fund, that's when you saw that premium soar to 175%. Okay, so that's the background. What then ended up happening is a bunch of Wall Street traders, by the way, many of whom are former ETF and derivatives traders. And I have said that, actually, I'll give Izzy Kaminska, former um, journalist at the Financial Times, she has, she pointed out, and she and I independently said the same thing, um, that, that I said it was the Wall Street traders who brought their trading games to Bitcoin um, to take advantage of that 175% premium. She got specific that it was actually the ETF traders, and she pointed out that the biggest blowups in Wall Street history, mainstream TradFi Wall Street history, were done by ETF traders. And guess what? Sam Bankman-Fried at Jane Street was an ETF trader by background. Okay, so I'm painting quite a picture here, um, which is that these Wall Street financial alchemy, Fugazi, to quote um, Arthur Hayes, um, transactions, came in to try to arbitrage that 175% premium. And my Newsweek op-ed piece called the SEC out for that because the SEC's mission as an agency is investor protection. But what was happening with regard to that 175% premium? Mom and pop retail were getting their pockets picked. And these big Wall Street hedge fund traders were the ones doing it. How did that help mom and pop? So let's, let's step back and summarize. The gist is we had a very strange market structure issue that had nothing to do with Bitcoin itself. The SEC let that market structure issue fester for six years before they approved a second version, the, uh, the Valkyrie Fund version of, um, of a Bitcoin trust. And as a result of the bull market and a huge supply demand imbalance, that premium went to 175% and then the correction swung to a 50% discount. We're not through it all yet. We don't know how this is all going to end. But what I will say is at this point, it it is extremely well telegraphed and no one knows whether it's already in the Bitcoin price, but the fights between the players who are still trying to allocate losses amongst themselves are happening out in the open on Twitter. Um, So it is pretty well telegraphed uh, that somebody's taking a loss, a pretty big loss in the next, you know, weeks and months. Um, But frankly, as you and I would like to say, the, the, that loss was already there. It's just a question now of recognizing it and moving on. And the last thing I'll point out is there are a couple of big pots of Bitcoin, of which GBTC is one. Uh, it's about 3% of the Bitcoin outstanding. Um, and then the Mt. Gox collapse uh, from 2014, which you and I have talked about before, that also has about the same size pot of Bitcoin outstanding. Um, And so these are overheads. You know, if you worry about secondary trading markets, you worry about these solutions, these these big chunks of Bitcoin coming to the market. But again, I would encourage people to step back, understand the technology and realize that the trading price, these, these really are not speculative assets. The trading price is not the most important thing you should be watching Bitcoin for. It's the actual application of the technology. And that's where... Oh boy, am I excited. So before we get back to the technology, I want to understand, is PAR, redeeming at PAR for GBTC holders in the range of outcomes that you see as the situation plays out? Well, potentially. uh, And of course, you know, what we're talking about today is potentially going to change day by day, maybe even hour by hour. Uh, so it's hard to predict. And I, I'm not an expert. I can't predict how it's going to play out. But the scenario in which that could happen is where there's what's called a Reg M conversion of it. And um, 
there is a group of Bitcoiners that have gathered as of this morning more than 20% of the GBTC trust to agree to try to vote out the existing manager. Now, again, I've not looked at the legal documents. I'm just reading analysis of people from all sides and uh, and understanding that that's not an easy task. So I don't think anyone should should conclude that it's the likeliest outcome, but that is an outcome in which that, that discount could be closed. Um, and the interesting question is, if that were to occur and we had mass redemptions of the so-called Hotel California, um, then, you know, how fast uh, would, would, would the actual on-chain Bitcoin be sold into the secondary market? I think you'd see an awful lot of people, um, again, because this is so well telegraphed, you, you'd see block trades, you'd see over-the-counter transactions, you'd see an awful lot of people step up. Um, and because this is, you know, it's there, there's a classic on, uh, you and I both worked at, at big investment banks over our careers, buy the rumor, sell the news. <laughs> um, and, and so, uh, you know, this would be kind of, you know, the, 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 the manifestation of that, that once that news hits, that, um, that people will actually, I think, be, um, they'll understand that a big overhang over the short-term stock, or short-term trading price of Bitcoin um, may be gone. But um, this is, this is going to take a while to play out. And again, I think it's so well telegraphed. It's not like anyone who's in this market right now isn't aware if they're not reading something about it um, because it's it's a front page headline in industry trade press pretty much every day and has been for weeks now. Yeah, and you know we have plenty of people that are watching the internals of GBTC shares, the way that those are trying to move through the market, and in the end, price is truth, right? So the discount to NAV is going to tell us what's going on in the story as it sinks to fifty. We know that there's a big problem if it rises. We know that arbitrage traders are trying to basically close the gap that might be in the cards in a legal proceeding. So really, I think that that discount will tell us a lot as it moves through the market. Uh, Caitlin, you mentioned it may or may hash not, rate. But... Yeah. Okay. Can Go I come ahead. back to, to, to one point on that? First of Please. all, obviously, neither one of us is making financial recommendations or investment recommendations here. But one thing I will say is that markets can get out of whack with fundamentals. And so, um, you know, this is the old debate about the efficient markets hypothesis. We saw that manifested in Bitcoin when the debate occurred in the halving. Was the halving, which happened in 2020, built into the Bitcoin price? And the answer was no, it wasn't, even though it was extremely well telegraphed. So, um, and, and it, you know, it's, it's it, it, Satoshi Nakamoto set that Bitcoin halving uh, algorithm and no one's changed it and no one almost certainly ever will be able to muster enough hash power to be able to vote to change that, right? So long story short, um, it, it, the efficient market hypothesis works in theory, but in reality, you can have scenarios where where securities trade at discounts or premiums for just technical reasons, just supply demand imbalance reasons, lack of liquidity, et cetera, et cetera. So I will caution that we just don't know um, how this is all going to play out and it may or may not come back, but uh, it may or may not already be in the price. Um, it, but this gets back to this whole, you know, in theory, it's in the price. In theory, there's perfect information. This is very well telegraphed. In financial markets, usually there is information asymmetry and there there isn't much information asymmetry in this one, which gives me some um, comfort that, uh, that, that it may already be in the price, but nobody knows. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. And I, no, and I appreciate your uh, pushback and uh, bringing back the efficient market hypothesis because our audience needs to understand as well the efficient market hypothesis says that everything is in the price today. My trader adage that price is truth is not the same thing as that. And so Caitlin's point is important. Just because we have certain amount of information doesn't mean that the price today is right. But the price reflects where the market believes it should be. That's what it means. And that the price, it also means that the price will move quickly as it discovers the truth, the ultimate truth, right? So in November of 2022, 
we see Bitcoin realizing the ultimate price of the of the fake Bitcoin uh, selling that F FTX was doing at the time. And so, and I know that something that you have pounded the table. So I wanted to talk about hash rate. Let's pause on that for a second. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about fake Bitcoin and what we saw in 2022. <laughs> um, can we think about what FTX was doing as selling fake Bitcoin? And is sure. that different than the idea that uh, you've been talking about for years, which is paper claims on Bitcoin that aren't properly reserved versus, you know, the outright fraud of not even trying to source Bitcoin on the other end. So give us your thoughts on the evolu evolution of your thesis here on paper claims of Bitcoin. Well, it hasn't evolved. And you, you, to answer your question, yes, uh, of course, that was a, an example of paper Bitcoin. It's an extreme example that helps illustrate the point. People put money into FTX thinking they were buying Bitcoin. FTX did not take their U.S. dollars and turn around and buy Bitcoin. But they did promise the Bitcoin back to the customers, allegedly. So therefore, um, there was basically a lot of paper Bitcoin created by FTX. Now, that is an allegedly extreme example of paper Bitcoin, where it sounds like FTX never bothered to buy Bitcoin on the real trading market to hold reserves of Bitcoin against the liabilities that they that they owed their trading customers. That's the allegation. And it sure looks like uh, as of now, based on uh, what the receiver has said, that that's indeed the case. They didn't actually go out and buy the Bitcoin, but they promised it back to their customers. That is literally paper Bitcoin. Now, in most cases, most of the paper Bitcoin isn't that extreme where there's literally no reserve against it at the intermediary. It's going to be more like there's a 10% reserve against it at the intermediary. And you know, we've seen that in the in some of the other chapter 11 filings where the 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 allegation isn't outright fraud, the allegation is just leverage. Well, leverage is another word for paper Bitcoin <laughs> in this instance, um, where basically they promised more Bitcoin than they had in reserve. And so here's the high level conclusion. Leverage that goes above one to one creates paper Bitcoin. That creates artificial supply. Leverage up to one to one is just fine because it's backed by real Bitcoin. So I'm not suggesting that all leverage is bad. There's a subtle but critical distinction. Leverage up to one to one that's backed by real Bitcoin, great, no problem. It helps to facilitate capital formation in markets. And there are 19.2 million Bitcoin outstanding. As long as there are no more than 19.2 million Bitcoin ever lent, then great. But the moment we go above 19.2 million Bitcoin lent, which the FTX example is an extreme example of that, but we saw that indeed with BlockFi, we saw it with Celsius, we saw it with Three Arrows, we saw it with Voyager, and even before that, we saw it with Cred. All of those companies have filed for chapter 11, and all of them had promised more claims to Bitcoin to their customers than they had actual Bitcoin in their possession. We do not have the ability to go out and figure out how to add up how many of those companies have promised how many Bitcoins to their customers, and therefore how many paper Bitcoins are outstanding to be able to compare it to the 19.2 million real Bitcoins that are outstanding all we can say is that we know there are a lot more than 19.2 million promised Bitcoins uh, and there are only 19.2 million real Bitcoins outstanding. And so this, this gets into this whole question of counterparty risk. How much do you trust the intermediary who's promised you Bitcoin? And unfortunately, what we've seen in these collapses of several intermediaries in the last six months-ish is that uh, in every case they had promised more Bitcoin than they had real reserves. So I want to understand your solution to this whole problem and explain it for us. But before we get to your, to your solution, explain to us the artificial supply that exists. What, how long, I know it's uh, impossible to predict, but how long does the legal system and the market need to work out of the both 
artificial supply overhang and the information that we need to pull from all the bankruptcy, as you mentioned, from all the bankruptcy proceedings, mm -hmm. that how much the quantitative impact of all of this. And of course, the market won't fully, I don't think, will fully be able to move on until it has all that information in hand. So right. how long should we be thinking that this whole thing will take to play out? Well, the market's going to estimate that. Um, again, th to your point, and your point is well taken. The price of any asset is the market's best estimate of the discounting of all of the information that is known at the time. Again, how well disseminated that information is, is a real question. And in a lot of instances, there's information asymmetry. And so it's not well disseminated. Um, and so the answer, Nick, is really, is really a tough one. Um, I've done a lot of work, as you and I have talked about and you've cited, uh, with Dr. Manmohan Singh of the IMF, who tries to estimate how many claims to U.S. dollars are outstanding in the world relative to the actual U.S. dollars circulating. And it's a big multiple. And, and the reality is he can only estimate this. He spent the bulk of his career. I've been following him since the 2008 financial crisis. He spent the bulk of his career being a specialist in trying to track this. And the answer is you never can quantify it precisely. It's not quantifiable because it's not disclosed on the balance sheets of these intermediaries. Um, and in the banks that he tracks where he tries to, to, to track the U.S. dollar debt exposure, the real debt exposure that's not reported by, you know, traditional metrics. Um, he's looking in the footnotes of the bank's financial statements, and those footnotes are only disclosed once a year. Uh, and you and I also know that the big banks do something called balance sheet window dressing at the end of a financial period, where they'll bring their leverage down to make it look like they um, they they are better capitalized, less leveraged th than they really are in intra quarter and especially intra day, um, and that's the reality. That's how it works. Everyone knows, including the regulators, that that's how it works. So the real leverage is a lot higher than even the the numbers that Dr. Manmohan Singh has been reporting. Um, but the, the, you know, one of the questions has been, uh, how do we try to do that? Can we try to do that for Bitcoin? And the answer is, all you can do is go look at the filings of the publicly traded companies to try to figure this out um, and the chapter 11 filings of the companies that went bust. What we have experienced in the case of the companies that filed chapter 11 and did go bust or that went bankrupt in, in outside of the United States, for example, like Mt. Gox in Japan or Quadriga in Canada, there are equivalent bankruptcy proceedings. What we've learned, unfortunately, is that when these, when these exchanges go naked short, um, they, in other words, they promise more Bitcoin to their customers and they have actual Bitcoins in their reserves, in their inventory. Um, when they do that, it's, it's usually pretty big. Um, they don't cheat by a little, they cheat by a lot. And um, <laughs> it's, it tends to be, unfortunately, that the recovery for the customers is pennies on the dollar. There's been one exception to that so far, and that was Mt. Gox. And there's a simple reason for that. Mt. Gox was so early in the process that Bitcoin's price was so low and it recovered. In fact, it's such an interesting situation because it's one of the few examples that I can think of. I'm certainly not a bankruptcy expert, but I've dug into this. It's one of the few examples where a company went into bankruptcy and during the bankruptcy process, it, it became no longer insolvent because the assets became worth so much more um, in, in fiat terms than the liabilities that they had promised. It, again, in fiat terms, in Bitcoin terms, they'll never get those, those paper Bitcoins uh, back. Those are lost forever because they never had them in the first place. But um, but, it, you know, if you look at it in, in yen terms or in U.S. dollar terms, Mt. Gox became solvent again as soon as the Bitcoin price started rallying. So it's an, it's an interesting people, the bankruptcy lawyers will write and, and bankruptcy um, finance people will write case studies about that once it's all done. But by the way, that happened. I got caught by Mt. Gox. It was the cheapest tuition I've ever paid as a Bitcoiner because I learned about how counterparty risk can really bite you and you can learn, you can lose essentially hundred percent of your Bitcoins. Um, and, so, and the point is that I will get some percentage of my Bitcoins back. It's going to, it's, it's going to end up 
being higher in U.S. dollar terms, most likely, knock on wood, because the payments are going to come out this summer. But um, but but I won't get the bitcoins themselves back, which as a bitcoiner, I'd rather have the bitcoins back. Um, uh, the, the full number of bitcoins that I that I thought I owned, but I had to learn the hard way. I didn't really own Bitcoin. What I owned was an IOU from an intermediary who was not being honest and who was rolling the dice behind the scenes and who had promised more Bitcoin than they actually had in inventory. That's the paper Bitcoin problem. Uh, it suppresses the price. It picks mom and pop's pockets. And uh, this is why you and I are big proponents of the not your keys, not your coins movement. Learn how to self-custody your Bitcoin. If you don't own on-chain Bitcoin, you don't own Bitcoin. What you own is an IOU. GBTC is an IOU. Um, your Bitcoin at, a, at an exchange is an IOU. What to, the, only, the only way for you to own real on-chain Bitcoin and to be your own bank and to not have counterparty exposure is for you to self-custody your Bitcoin. Teach yourself that lesson. Absolutely. We have a self-custody message and we are going to continue that at the Bitcoin layer. So what is the solution from the industry perspective, Caitlin? Because I know you're working on solutions um, so that it's not just all self-custody, that there are parties involved that can fit into a framework that makes us more confident. Obviously, the only way to have Bitcoin is to have it yourself, but yes. there can be intermediaries that adhere to certain measures. So talk to us about that. What are you working on in terms of that? What are the solutions here? Well, the state of Wyoming created special purpose depository institutions to be custodians for Bitcoin and other forms of digital assets. And they are required by law not to lend and they are prohibited by law from rehypothecating, which is essentially what we're just talking about, creating more claims to, to Bitcoin than real Bitcoins in inventory. Um, in fact, actually, there's an interesting Supreme Court case that came out in Wyoming in the 80s where somebody who had tried to rehypothecate an industrial diamond, in other words, he would pledged it as security for a loan at one bank. And because he was in possession of the diamond, he turned around and pledged it as security for a different loan at a different bank. Well, both banks had collateral in the form of that industrial diamond, but neither bank knew that the other's loan existed. That was fraud. And that was litigated up to the Wyoming Supreme Court. It's a, it's a case, 1986, I believe, called Smith v. State. And the Supreme Court of Wyoming held that that was fraud. It was felony fraud. Um, okay, so now what's fun is what I just described to you happens every day in spades in the securities markets, okay? It's never been litigated, but someday somebody will litigate it under state fraud laws. Because Wyoming's fraud law is not that different. It's, it gets a uniform fraud law, as I recall. Um, and most states have the same fraud laws. And so if, if, you, if you are not knowingly giving your financial institution the ability to take your asset and turn around and leverage it for its own benefit, and therefore you're taking on a whole bunch of counterparty risk that you don't realize you're taking on, that's fraud. Now, maybe... Just maybe in the in the aftermath and all the litigation of the cleaning up the the um, the, the blow ups in the um, leveraged digital asset space, maybe that will be litigated. There was a collective gasp that happened last week when the bankruptcy judge revealed a decision uh, that the um, that the bitcoins that were in Celsius's accounts in their wallets rather belonged to the Celsius estate, not to the individual customers. And I'm not surprised by that because that's how it, financial intermediaries work. The individual customers are what's called general creditors of the financial institution. And everything gets pooled and you get a percentage of the pooled assets. That's what it means to be a general creditor. Whatever's left over after the senior creditors get paid out, you get, you get a percentage of that pool. And it's going to be pennies on the dollar, most likely. Now, the collective gasp that occurred shouldn't have occurred because if folks had read the fine print, there are at least allegations that that was disclosed. I will let the courts figure out whether that was indeed sufficiently disclosed. 
But to get back to your point, how do we solve this? How do we prevent dishonest people or just leverage business models from going bankrupt and taking people's Bitcoins? The answer is you, if you have to have an intermediary, then it may as well be one that actually is required by law to segregate customer assets, not to lend them, to be 100% solvent, 100% reserved. Um, and in fact, to have some capital on top of that to absorb um, operational losses and, and other, other items. The one thing that cannot be solved in Bitcoin because these are bearer instruments is theft. So everyone needs to understand if that, that any theft of Bitcoin because these are bearer instruments is going to be a loss, whether it's through an intermediary or whether it's through you losing your private key or being hacked yourself. That is going to be a loss. There's no way to ensure that um, at two, uh, at 100 cents on the dollar losses. There are there is an insurance market, but it's again it's cents on the dollar in in the in the grand scheme of things. It's not likely to give you 100 cents on the dollar back. Um, so that's just a risk that the industry that that is inherent in the industry. Uh, and there's another risk that's inherent in the industry, which is protocol failure. Every day that goes by, the probability of the protocol failing goes down exponentially, and it's an asymptote. Um, we're very close to zero because Bitcoin is now 14 years old. Thank you, Satoshi. But it's never going to be zero. Um, this is the Lindy effect in software. Every day that a software system um, remains functional, the probability that somebody finds a zero-day exploit to take it down goes down exponentially. Um, but it never reaches zero. So everyone needs to understand there are risks in everything. And it's just a matter of you figuring out what risks you are willing to take on. Uh, and as you know, Nick, there are certain types of investors, certain types of holders of Bitcoin who are prohibited from self-custodying it. And indeed, that's one of the reasons uh, that, that the Wyoming Special Purpose Depository ex uh, Institutions exist, um, to be able to to provide custody services for those types of, of users who cannot by law self-custody. And what I'm alluding to here is 40 Act mutual funds, registered investment advisors, there's something called the investor protection rule. And there's also something called the custody rule. They essentially say the same thing. These are US SEC rules that, that say that the asset manager has to segregate the custody of the assets from the asset management itself. There were too many shenanigans done, especially in the in the Roaring Twenties that came out in the Depression, and there were these two laws passed in the nineteen in 1940 in the U.S. that required the segregation of asset management from custody, and that's what I'm mostly alluding to here. But I would also say corporate treasurers are the same way. They don't want to self custody. They don't want to deal with bearer instruments. They want a, a an arm's length third party to be standing in between. But everyone should recognize the moment you inject an, an arm's length third party to quote Nick Szabo, that's a security hole. What you've done is solve one problem, but take on additional risk. And so everyone should understand that uh, nothing's riskless. You, you just need to figure out what your risk tolerance is um, and then try to minimize it and, um, and mitigate it as much as possible. What are some of the challenges to proof of keys as it exists today and where are the holes in that? Uh, just yep. to bring everyone on the same page, proof of keys is a way to, as a qualified custodian, a way for the custodian to prove that they have the Bitcoin that they that uh, the customers have claims against. Correct. Now we can prove the Bitcoin with signing a message that is published to the blockchain and so that anybody with a node can confirm that. But there are holes in that process, especially on the liability side. So summarize how you're thinking about that these days. Yeah, uh, well, proof of reserves is, 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 is necessary, but not sufficient is the way I'd put it. Um, it's helpful, it's better than nothing. Um, and, and frankly, whoever's doing the proof of reserves is an auditor, so it's not completely trustless. Uh, but what we've seen is that there are, there are different flavors of proof of reserves. Someone might say, here's a published proof of reserve. All that says is that the custodian or the exchange has control of that wallet, but that doesn't mean that somebody else doesn't either. And that doesn't mean that they legally own the, own the assets in that wallet. 
Um, moreover, the, the biggest um, problem with proof of reserves is that it's proof of the assets held by the custodian or exchange, but not proof of the assets relative to the liabilities they've, they've promised out. Okay, so um, until you can get Merkle tree liabilities, <laughs> where you can, you can actually check to, to verify that the liabilities match up with the assets, um, it, it, you're never going to get 100% trustless proof of reserves. But all that said, it's better than a traditional financial audit, um, but it suffers from some of the same things as a traditional financial audit. You, you are relying on the auditor. It is a snapshot in time. Um, at least a f traditional financial audit is going to go in and, and verify that there isn't anybody else or do the best they can to verify that there isn't anybody else who's also um, in control of that private key. But one of the hard parts of proving that you're the only one in control of the private key is that a private key can be replicated without the auditor's knowledge. Um, and so this is where there are elaborate key generation ceremonies that are done by the exchanges and custodians to try to prove to the auditor that that there isn't a, a duplicate of that key. Uh, but you never can get 100% certain on, on, on these things. Again, it's, it's kind of like the Lindy effect. It never goes to a 0% probability that someone finds the zero day exploit in the protocol. It, it, it just keeps getting closer and closer to zero, but never, never reaches zero. What do you think about exchanges that are not um, doing proof of reserves and they, like we saw CZ say, you know, my, my lawyers will show you if, if that's what it takes or something like that. And then, you know, other exchanges uh, saying that we don't feel that it's necessary. Do you think that that's okay because of the holes in providing proof of reserves that doesn't actually tell the full story? Well, again, this gets back to the counterparty risk and the information asymmetry. That is inherently the biggest problem in the financial services industry, period. Information asymmetry. The, the, the intermediary will always know more about its true financial condition than you will. And there's also the, the, just the expertise gap that even if they publish something like proof, proof of reserves, how does the average person know how to interpret that? How does the average person know how to interpret what an auditor says? Right. Those are so, so carefully balanced, those audit reports, um, the lawyers comb over them. Right. And they're, you know, filled with all kinds of caveats. Right. So how does the average person really know? The answer is you don't. Um, you can't know with 100 percent certainty. So uh, I think, again, it's shades of gray. And all I would say is this gets this is one of the reasons why you and I are such strong proponents of the not your keys, not your Bitcoin movement, uh, because it is it, it really is, uh, trusting an intermediary is its own can of worms. And I say that just like Jesse Powell does. I say that as somebody who's building a financial institution that will offer custody services. Just like Jesse Powell is saying that with Kraken, don't use them. <laughs> take, your, take the Bitcoin into self-custody. Teach yourself self-custody. Don't uh, I'm not marketing the product. First of all, it's not ready to, to market anyway. We're not launched with it yet as a bank. But um, second, most importantly, conceptually understand why we're telling you that you shouldn't use our product. It's not, not very common that financial institutions will tell you you shouldn't use, use our product. We're offering it mostly for the people who have no choice but to use the product and then trying to do it in a way that replicates the ethos of Bitcoin itself, no, non-lending. This doesn't need to be someone's IOU. If it is someone's IOU, then it's 100% backed with reserves. And also, we haven't talked about this yet, a property rights-based regime. In Wyoming, the special purpose depository institutions have the option to offer custody in a pooled way, like is traditionally done in financial services and done with all Bitcoin um, custodians today. But in Wyoming, there's something special, which is that they can offer what's called custody under bailment. Bailment is the law of coat checks and valet parking garages. When you turn your, when you park your car at a garage and you get the ticket back from the valet, that valet is taking temporary possession of your property, but they're not taking legal title to it. It's still your property. And if that garage goes out of business while your car is parked there, all you have to do is walk up, ask for your key and drive it away. 
you're not waiting for a bankruptcy judge to tell you, no, that, that car belong, didn't belong to that garage and you've got to wait months to go and, and, and take it away. No, that was always yours. We've gotten so far away from that in financial services. Most folks don't realize that the dollars in your bank account and the securities in your brokerage firm are both IOUs. You have lent them to your intermediary and you don't have a property right. What you have is an IOU, which is a contractual right. And contractual rights are not as well protected in, in the law as property rights. And so what Wyoming has done with the special purpose depository institutions is allow them to offer custody of digital assets under bailment. So, so it's just like the coat check and just like the garage. Um, and that property is just, there, is just inside the money warehouse, if you will, for safekeeping. It does not belong to the estate of the intermediary. Big difference versus what's available in custody today. And now I'll pause and ask a rhetorical question. Why do you think the big banks have fought the Wyoming special purpose depository institutions as hard as they have? Absolutely. Uh, it sounds like, Caitlin, you uh, might have written layered money yourself, uh, the <laughs> way that you're talking about the IOU construct. But, you know, our audience is has to understand that the word layer in our company name and in the book, Layered Money, layer refers to the separation of assets and liabilities on the balance sheet. What layer is your money on? And if you have Bitcoin <laughs> yourself, there is no balance sheet above you. You Correct. are at the top of your own monetary pyramid. And when you have a claim, you are not. It comes down to the side of the balance sheet on which your asset exists. And so it is a message that we are consistently trying to deliver here at the Bitcoin layer to explain to people what layer of money is your money on. And even with treasuries, we don't know. Um, we don't know everything that goes on in the on the leverage side of things that has to do with the repo market it also has to do with the rehypothecation market all of these things we could have i'm glad we're talking about bitcoin today but we could have done a full non-bitcoin show maybe Correct. we'll have you back in a few months to do that same concept uh, right and so well yeah. i love the way you put it nick i love the way you put it you need to understand what layer your money is on how Absolutely. many layers of intermediaries are between you and the actual legal title to the financial asset yeah yeah and the answer is how many balance sheets that's the same answer right and and that's what it comes down to and each balance sheet has a degree of trust uh, that goes along with it and how much do you trust that is going to impact your decision and that's i think kate the part of caitlin's message today is the second that you're on the other side of the balance sheet you've introduced trust and how do Correct. we manage that trust as uh, Bitcoin investors? And one of the big takeaways is don't take it <laughs> off and do it yourself unless you're made to do so. You it's mentioned impossible having, to do that with U.S. Yeah. dollars, though, as you as you well know. Of course, right? the only of people course. who can get the real U.S. dollars, actually, really, because dollars are all IOUs. Every U.S. dollar is debt. Uh, the only ones who can get access to the real Fed Fed U.S. dollars are banks themselves. Yeah, of course, and in 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 some ways additionally those that can prove non rehypothecated custody of their us treasuries as well so that's another nuance there again probably for a different show we could we could talk for a long time about oh, that yes. but i want to get back to bitcoin and talk about the having you mentioned the having yeah. we're now we're now coming up um on the having i think we just crossed the two thirds somewhere in the yep. 60 60s right we're at two thirds uh, the way to the next having. So yep. what what is the having to you as we go into now another cycle? Is it going to prove out again? The question everyone wants to know, <laughs> is the having and the supply dwindling a main or the main driver of the Bitcoin price over a long term? Uh, what are your thoughts about the having? Yes, absolutely. It's because Bitcoin is designed to be scarce. So this is not a radical concept in the sense that Satoshi figured out how to make data unique. If something is unique and it has demand, then it has value. Very simple. So 
if Bitcoin becomes more scarce over time, then in theory, as long as it continues to have demand, its value should go up over time. And I believe that it will, as long as it continues to have demand. Where's that demand coming from? A lot of it has been speculative demand, which you and I wish hadn't been around. Um, but a lot of it increasingly is real use demand. Uh, and, and, and here's where Americans just d generally don't understand. But a lot of folks around the rest of the world certainly do understand the concept of hyperinflation, um, having assets that, that uh, they can store the, the fruits of their labor in um, as a store of value that will retain its value and potentially even go up over time. So uh, in about 15 months, give or take, there will be another Bitcoin halving. And if past is prologue, what that means is about six to nine months later, the Bitcoin price will start to rally. Now, there's been a lot of ink spilled on why is it six to nine months after the halving? Because we, we see the halvings coming. We talked about that early. Um, and there's a big discussion about efficient markets hypothesis. Everyone knows the halvings are coming in Bitcoin. They're programmed. Satoshi programmed them and they're not changing almost certainly ever, but um, we see them coming. And yet what we've experienced in the 2020 having is that it wasn't in the price. And that's where there's a lot of speculation. To me, the most credible reason why it hasn't appeared to be in the price has to do with a lot of the technicals behind the scenes about Bitcoin mining, which is a whole other episode in and of itself. But what you have is that mining profits, every time the halving happens, mining profits get cut in half. Um, and so you would think that the miners are not, well, they're certainly less profitable when their profits get cut by half, their profit margin gets cut by half. But in fact, what ends up happening is that trading volume, use case volume has started to, uh, to, to actually more than make up for the reduction in mining rewards. And so the, while profit margins go down, volume goes up, ergo price goes up. Now, um, I like to analogize this. I was around in the stock market when the U.S. stock market went from fractions to decimalization. You used to trade fractions in eight, uh, t trade stocks in eighths, um, so which is 12 and a half cents. Uh, and now we trade stocks in actually fractions of a penny. But for most part, stocks trade in pennies. So we, instead of having eighths, now they're you can trade them in one hundredths. Um, and so the gist is, what do you think that did to the commissions of the stockbrokers when that happened? They got cut substantially because the bid offer spread was no longer quoted in 12 and a half cent increments. They're now quoted in one cent increments and even today in sub one cent increments. So profit margins went down by a lot. But yet, you, you didn't see the brokerage firms fail. In fact, actually, they thrived. Why? Because trading volumes went way up. And it's, it, that's the best analogy for what I have to explain why, the mar why miners end up getting, um, end up winning from this process, even though their, their, their margins go down. But it does take, there's a shakeout that, that occurs anytime you have a margin cut like that. To, to your payment processors, which is effectively what the, what the Bitcoin miners are, it does take some time for, for them to recover. And that is the best explanation I can give for, for typically why historically it's taken six to nine months. And that has been the pattern. We're in our fourth, this is my fourth cycle, Bitcoin itself, um, uh, uh, again, having been created in 2009, um, and, and, you know, we've seen these cycles before and history has repeated. That does not mean it will repeat again, um, but there's a good fundamental reason to expect it to. So we're going into the fourth halving and you heard it, you heard it here first, the halvings still matter. I mean, it comes down oh, yes. to basic supply and, uh, Caitlin, we appreciate your time so much. Uh, your range of expertise is so wide and there's so many ways that you can uh, help educate our audience. So we really appreciate your time. Uh, Caitlin, before we sign off, give people a place to find you and how we can support your work going forward on uh, the path to educate people about Bitcoin. Oh, yes. Best place to find me is on Twitter and LinkedIn. Those are the two social media platforms at Caitlin Long underscore. Uh, and then um, Custodia Bank. Uh, stay tuned. We haven't talked much about the bank, but it is a bank built by folks who are 
financial, who are financial market veterans, but who are also veterans of the digital asset industry, many of us pre-hardcore Bitcoiners. And so it's a, it's a unique combination. Stay tuned for news about Custodia Bank in the future. Excellent. When, well, when we get more news and more official releases, we'll have you back on to talk about your products uh, even more. Caitlin, yep, thank you so it. much for joining us today at the Bitcoin Layer. The Bitcoin Layer is sponsored by Voltage, a provider of enterprise-grade Bitcoin infrastructure. Thanks, everyone, for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, Nick.